All right. David, Jen, I put a team together. We're going to record a podcast. You in? I'm in. I'm the wheel man. I guess. <laughs> I'll be the hacker. Jen, you're the hacker. I'm the face man. Yes. Excellent. And welcome to Stasis Pod, the Transformers Rescue Bots podcast. I'm Rob. I'm Jen. And I'm David. And today we are three of the parts of Cody's Eleven. <laughs> uh, in fact, uh, as research, and also because it was on TV, I watched the original Ocean's Eleven. Uh, Ooh, like the original original? The original original, like with Sinatra and the rest of the Rat Pack, which is mostly Sinatra and the Rat Pack kind of dicking around and sort of making a movie for two hours. <laughs> I mean... Yeah, I've heard it's not great. But it's not no, it, a movie. I don't think I've ever actually seen that one. I know I haven't seen the new ones. But uh, um, you know, is, it, it, isn't that a movie that ends with a stinger? Or like, not really a sting, but end? it it does have like a surprisingly downbeat ending for oh. kind of a goofy heist movie from 1960. Oh. Spoilers if you have not seen this movie that is now uh, very old, uh, almost 70 years old. It's uh, from the 60s. 1960 on the dot. Ah. So uh, during the job, one of the one of the their 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 guys dies of like a heart ailment, hmm. and so they try and smuggle his their the money out of Las Vegas in his in his coffin. Yeah. However, they instead his wife decides to uh, have cremated. a funeral in <laughs> yes in Las Vegas, and during the funeral he is cremated with all of the money they've stolen. Uh, well, I guess they couldn't line. show people succeeding at crime. I don't know. Yeah, it was harder to do back then. Well, by the 60s... No, I guess it wasn't until I, the 70s, really. I think by the 60s, you could show them succeeding at crime because the guy they're stealing from is also like a gangster. Ah. Uh. Yeah. Well, you anyway, did say so, Las Vegas, so yes. Yes. <laughs> uh, well, specifically, they're stealing from the Joker because it's Cesar Romero. <gasps> Ooh. Yes. Oh, maybe I should see that movie. It's mustache. I mean, like I said, it's it's anyway. It, it is these <laughs> ones. I think are kind of more on the modern heist template uh, with uh, the the George Clooney Ocean's Eleven movies. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Anyway, so this is the uh, this is the twenty first episode of season four. This is the ninety ninth episode of Rescue Bots overall. Uh, first aired September seventeenth, twenty sixteen, and are written by. Uh, speaking of Cesar Romero, uh, written by Joseph Kerr. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Kerr. Uh, you know, Joe Kerr. Oh, oh no. Wow. Oh, no. Uh. And who has actually written for a bunch of Batman cartoons. <laughs> hmm. I mean, he has to. And also wrote a bunch of Transformers Prime, but this is his only Rescue Bots episode. All oh. right. What's well, fun for... Being someone who normally writes for Prime. Yes. And we we open with Maven Danger. Yay! The dun, just dun, 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 close dun, enough dun, 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 to dun. not get sued version of James Bond. Yes. Well, there's enough, like, lots of people parody James Bond. It's really easy to get away with. Oh, sure. That music sting is getting real close, though. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, the music, that's a little bit more, but eh, I guess it's close enough. Uh, as we as we know, he we has uh, previously been seen in such films as The Spy with the Golden Diamond <laughs> and Live Twice Tomorrow. <laughs> Die another solace. Um, <laughs> and, and the the Blofeldish bad guy has an evil stoat. Yes, uh, yes, an evil stoat, and also he is Doctor Nah. Yeah, uh, I hate that. Like, oh, you want to make a play off Dr. No, but no, uh, even for a kid's cartoon, that's, that's a painful joke. I like that. I wonder if they tried Dr. Nope and it was, uh, oh no, that's too close. We, we will be sued by, uh, the estate of Cubby Broccoli. <laughs> oh, there's gotta be a, something better. Or just use a different language. Dr. Nine. Dr. Nine. Dr. Nine. There you go. I don't know if you... German Germany's evil. Fine. Yeah. Everybody knows Germany is evil. Yeah. 
Well, just look at his stoat. He has an eye patch. Evil. I mean, he is obviously <laughs> evil. Uh, he's, he's he's like a like a danger mouse kind of kind of stoat. Yes. <laughs> what was it? Oh, what was the name of the evil one? Pen, Penfold? Mm. No, Penfold. That was his sidekick. Eh, it's been so long. I don't remember danger. Mouse. So uh, so so Blades, Cody, and Chase are watching this. Of course, Blades and Cody are having a great time. Chase, you know, even if you're stealing from a bad guy, that's still stealing, and he's not okay with it. No. Mm. They try to explain that stealing from bad people is okay, and he says, I remain dubious, as I suspect your legal system would. <laughs> but anyway, this just happens to be interrupted by some weird energy readings that just have to be, uh, have to be occurring off the island. And, so, and uh, they get this message from uh, our old pal Salvage. Yay! Yeah. Everybody's favorite affable, affable garbage truck. I like him. I like him a lot. I need Unfortunately, to find he a... does not get to be part of Cody's Eleven, no. even though he's in the episode. I need to find a toy of him at the flea market, because that would be the most appropriate place. <laughs> yes. It's, it's what he would have wanted. Yes. Hopefully we'll get a uh, some sort of, like, legacy salvage. That would we be... Chase. I... That would be great. I would like that a lot. I'm going to imagine we'll get more rescue bots. I don't know if we'll go to salvage, but more garbage trucks is great, so... I would hope. Yeah. I guess I wonder how if they could make one out of that uh, junk yon to dump uh, oh, garbage truck. They yeah, made. Mm. that's that's promising. That's promising. I yeah. I would check, but mine is sort of partially disassembled to make a junky asaurus. Oh right. So yeah, they are detecting energon off uh, offshore. It turns out it is aboard this offshore energy uh, or offshore drilling rig. Hmm. So uh, nobody is there. So uh, so unfortunately, we may have stumbled into an episode of Robots in, <laughs> in Disguise. Uh, is it in my notes? Of... Says, oh, I guess this is in Crown City. <laughs> That's right. If it's fully automated, it must be Crown City. Crown City. Uh, no one America's has highest unemployment rate. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Number one employer: the guy who services automated machinery. <laughs> I mean, that's a job. It, yeah. Until they automate it next year. Yes. Mm. Yeah. So it, I mean, it I, does... clearly the only the the only uh, jobs there that we can really see are a um, tour guide, scrapyard owner, and b uh, demolition derby driver. Yes. Yeah. Everything I mean, else, robots. This sounds like actually a place I would like to live. <laughs> Just hanging out in the junkyard with your uh, estranged son and your uh, collection of garbage. Yes. I kind of hate it when we come up for an idea of something that would have been funny in a previous show we already finished. <laughs> like, counting up the jobs in that show. Because there was also, like, oh, museum yeah. security guard. Like, I think the total of jobs would be ten, maybe? <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't know. But we a kinda, lot of like, it would just be weird one-offs. <laughs> yeah, like, deranged recluse. Is that a job? I hope so. Because we had one of those guys who turned up a couple of times. Guy who lives in a camper. Actually, it may not even be ten jobs. Jeez, that's... I want my job to job. be guy who lives in a camper. I mean, one of the jobs was, like, <laughs> Arctic scientists that only have... You can hear their voice in a shed. Yes. <laughs> so... Can you come back later? We're kind of doing the thing in here. I was going to say, it would have been great if they could have just gotten Keith David for just one line. Well, you, oh, man. they or, wouldn't even have to do that. Just make a reference. It's like, child, calm down back there, or something. <laughs> <laughs> or they could have got uh, the, uh, the what was it, uh, Windows in that, who I think was the voice actor of the best friend on Turbo Teen. Oh, <gasps> that's oh. right. I think, is he also on Visionaries? Uh, I will have to look into that. Okay. I think he, he was in something right. else, but yeah, I remember that now. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Looking that up and being like, oh, wow. So anyway, it turns out that uh, it, it looks like the uh, the platform has somehow dug up raw energon. Because, yes, the planet has energon. Too much energon. Oh, always does. I mean, maybe not too much, but... <laughs> So 
So so so a storm is a brewing, so they're gonna come back and get this energy when it's not storming. But unfortunately, somebody and by which I mean a resident evil businesswoman, Madeline Pinch, is there. Uh, but she's conveniently invisible. So she has now heard them talking about how, how totally cool Energon is. Hmm. Which means that by the time they get there the next day to retrieve this Energon, uh, it's gone. <gasps> yep. And also this uh, this drilling rig is owned by a bevy of shell corporations, so it's impossible to find out uh, who actually owns it. Hmm. Oh, he was uh, he was Rocksteady, one of Raoul's buddies in uh, oh, Autobot. Oh, okay. Oh, nice. And also in one of the greatest horror films ever made, and Autobop. It's fantastic. I know. <laughs> Some good crossover. Good crossover. Uh, well, so, you know, we're all pretty bummed about this, but the good news is the carnival is in town. Yay. And Heatwave has decided that he's going to rescue children from getting ripped off by carnies. <laughs> by just helping them cheat at uh, this test your strength thing. Yeah, they're they're <laughs> that like, poor Carney is not. He's not angry, but he's definitely not happy. Hopefully, no. this is not coming out of his paycheck, which is going to be like a six pack of beer. Well, he he is a Carney, so you know it, it feels good to cheat him, but it's still like that's just you're tapping it with one finger and breaking the bell every time. <laughs> it's a bit Shake harder, boy. I like that Blades is the one actually handing out the toys to the kids because I'm sure he wanted to do that. I'm sure he specifically asked to do that. Hmm. Uh, so, and meanwhile, while that is going on, Danny and Cody are on the uh, this terrifying super magnetic Ferris wheel. Hmm. Yeah, why does this not have safeguards in place? <laughs> yeah, it, it seems because magnets really like. It's a cool but really bad idea. Cade is not I mean, going on the Ferris wheel because he does not believe in Ferris wheels. Oh, which I would yeah. like to know whether th- whether that means like morally or like he does like fairies. <laughs> well, you know what he does believe in? Corn dogs. Delicious yes. corn dogs. Yes. Oh, he absolutely does. Because he is not only double fisting corn dogs, he is holding a third corn dog in his mouth. <laughs> yeah, three corn dog style. It's like, it works. Listen, it's possible he's bringing one or possibly even two of these corn dogs to another person, but I think we all know he's going to eat all three and then return for more. Uh, yes. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, his girlfriend no might see a stick, but not no corn dog. <laughs> oh, no, Haley. He's got to give Haley a corn dog. Hmm. Uh, fun fact, in Canada, those are referred to as pogos. Really? I will have to learn pogos? all of these secrets before I, I journey into Canada. Pogo. That's right. Pogo? What? They, they just, it makes me... Th- like a pogo stick. Okay, I was just thinking Walt Kelly's Not- pogo and trying to think, uh- wait, is it a Cajun connection? <laughs> is it a cattail that's no, edible? Uh- it's a, it, it's actually because uh, we make our our corn dogs out of a hundred percent possum meat. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. I didn't know you had that many possums up there, but okay. We do in southwestern Ontario. Most other places, it's too cold for them. <laughs> but we certainly have possums here. It's because their tails don't have any fur. Yes, that'd be fine. You got rats up there too. Anyway, Ch- Chekhov's Ferris wheel. Ah, Captain, yes, I, uh, I'm i afraid the power has gone <laughs> off on the, on the Ferris wheel, and it is now uh, uncontrollably rolling into the town. Because, like, I, it, uh, it's only held on there by magnets, which Science Captain. Island looks cool, but, like, there's no safety measures in case of, well, normal blackout, let alone island-wide of- blackout. Yeah, there's not only there's a blackout that not only knocks out the regular power, but also the backup mm. power. Which means that, yeah, this thing is uh, hurtling out of control like uh, like we're in a late period Pirates of the Caribbean movie. And how do you even set this Ferris wheel up? Like, how do you get it down? You just turn the magnet off and hope? Uh, magnets? Sure. Of course, I knew immediately this Ferris I wheel know. was going to do something. It was just like, is it going to go for 1941 or are we going to go uh, Godzilla versus Mothra? Oh, what happens to Godzilla versus Mothra? Uh, a giant flying evil moth picks up the Ferris wheel and smacks it into Godzilla's face. Immediately, the moth oh, is that's, named. Uh, that's unfortunate. The moth is named Batra. 
Okay. So, it, it, and it's not a bat, I know, but it looks cool. Sorry, I continued recording there, but my internet had a hiccup. So oh, no. Okay. I dropped it, and I, it seems to be okay now, but hopefully it's not okay. a sign of problems to come. We went on a Ferris wheel digression as long as the square That is fine. There. I did not stop recording. Hmm. So luckily, the bots do indeed... Uh, do indeed save this uh, this careening Ferris wheel from plunging over a cliff. It's runaway Ferris wheel. It, it does, in fact, pull a 1941 in that it starts rolling away. Yes. <laughs> Although down a road instead of down a dock. But... Mm. And it doesn't almost drown Eddie Deason. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of robots in disguise. Yeah. Well, so, yeah. So uh, they can't figure out what caused this uh, this power outage, but uh, they get a call from Doc Green. He says, you know, why don't you check out the news? So uh, it is Huxley Prescott making a rare trip to the mainland where he has probably numerous outstanding warrants on him. <laughs> and this is the second time he's been on the mainland? Because he was on there. I think he was also there for the race a couple episodes Yes, ago. he was there for the race track. I'm trying to remember an instance other than that. I feel like maybe he had, like... Like, he's got numerous aliases on the mainland, <laughs> and Huxley Prescott is just the name he has on the island. It could yeah. be. Ken has those vibes. Like, they're actually going to look into it, and they find out that Huxley Prescott was, like, a child who died of pneumonia in, uh, like, 1952. <laughs> I mean, that sounds about right. Oh, he's, he's Hector Ramirez's illegitimate son. <gasps> dun, dun, dun. <laughs> Uh, but now he's reporting on Madeline Pinch and her new product, Pinchonium, <laughs> uh, which she contains within Pinch Shells, which is a, the miracle power s- source of the future. And so, of course, now they realize that the Pinchonium is Energon, and this is why when they went back, that Energon was Energon. <laughs> so I, the, the whole vibe of this interview, I have this weird thing about watching local news. I like watching local news programming. Mm-hmm. And occasionally during ad segments, you'll get this ad and it's usually for something like vinyl siding or for like windows. It's usually some kind of home improvement stuff, but they'll do these commercials that are set up. They're done to look like a news segment on the program you're watching because they are trying to sell this to like people in their 70s. (laughs) Who are maybe not as as savvy. And especially when, when she's like, glad you asked that. That was like exactly the energy of one of those little info news segments. <laughs> and I can definitely it, it, see Huxley Prescott having a side business doing those. It's got big infomercial vibes. Yeah, yeah it's, it's very like an infomercial interview. I, don't you hate it when this happens to you? <laughs> And you have a giant power outage that set that shuts down the entire eastern seaboard. <laughs> well, that definitely won't happen if you use these pinch cells. Also, l- l- listen, if your last name is Pinch, you've got to come up and you're going to name a bunch of products after yourself. You've got to get a better name. Or not name them after yourself. Yeah, yeah maybe just don't name them after yourself, though. Like, so, like say what you will about Elon Musk, but at least he's not attempting to sell a bunch of products named Musk. <laughs> Musk trucks. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> Space well, Musk. Because... Ew. <laughs> Musk X. Oh. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, at least he didn't rename Twitter Musk. Exactly. I mean, he might as well have because it's pretty musky over there. But Well, this is true. Yeah, he did do stink. But, uh, but Also, you will note that this is definitely the aligned continuity because the Energon is blue. Yes. Hmm. Oh, did we skip over the part where they were complaining about the Transformers are down? That is the next part. Oh, that's right. Yes, Transformers down all over the East Coast. And yes. indeed, uh, this makes uh, Blades terribly upset. Blades yeah. is very concerned. You know, don't worry, Blades. It's just named for uh, for Earth electrical equipment. Well, why not just say that? I was worried sick. <laughs> <laughs> he was so concerned. It's like the jokes whenever a Transformer blows out. Yes. And the power goes down. 
Anyway, so they realize that A, she has, uh, over, she's now overheard their conversation, and so she knows what Energy John can do, but what she doesn't know is what Quick Shadow is about to tell them. Uh, or sorry, what Boulder is about does, to tell them, which is that Chase uh, does note that their loose leaks did sink this proverbial ship. <laughs> yes. Uh, because yeah, these things are just powered by raw energon, and Madeline Pinch doesn't know anything about raw energon. These are just going to explode in like three days. Yeah, these things are maybe not ready for market. Yeah, and indeed, that is when Quick Shadow drops in, complete with uh, Bond esque theme music, as uh, she too has been watching Madeline Pinch and has been uh, tracking her all over Europe, where she's attempted to control the world's energy supply. I think there's a shot of her from that, like, meeting of, of uh, like, uh, like evil meeting for the beating of the naked gun. <laughs> <laughs> oh. There's, like, a bunch of, like, Eastern European terrorists and oil sheiks there. Mm. Yes. So they've, uh, they've, so she has stolen a whole bunch of technology. Not only this Energon, but she's also got uh, the invisibility technology from the Velgrox aliens. Hmm. Uh, she's got the phase bits from the Griffin Rock Express, allowing her to go all Kitty Pride, and she's got the Vern device, allowing her to stay young looking. Question yes, mark. Yes, and also, also allowing her to be scared stupid and to save Christmas and go to camp. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, man, I like to go to camp. How about uh, I? I might just settle for uh, being scared stupid. Huh. That's fair. Although I will note that in addition to going to camp, he also went to jail. I yeah. did really like Ernest Goes to Camp as a kid. I watched that movie a lot. I have not seen a single Ernest movie. Really? I think I was just a little too young. To, I, I missed the, I missed Ernest Mania. I would I would say to start with Goes to Camp. I feel like that was really like the a, a very solid eighties. I mean, that, that does seem to be, like, Varney's magnum opus. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I mean, it's either that or, uh, or what is it, uh, Dr. Otto and the Riddle of the Gloom Beam? Ooh. That, I don't think I've seen that That's more obscure. I've heard of it, haven't seen it. I think that's, like, the origin of the Ernest character. Like, he well, plays, like, five different five characters different things, in Yeah. <laughs> Including an evil scientist with a hand on his head. Anyway, uh, before we leave the subject, please Google Jim Varney and realize that he was, in fact, hot. It's a disturbing <laughs> revelation, but it is unfortunately true. Well, he, 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 John Cena is tr- sort of aging into Jim Varney. He, he is aging. Is. He's like a huge Jim Varney. It's, yeah. it's terrifying. It's a little weird. It's a little weird. Yes, as we previously discussed, I am the member of the group here who did go to camp. Uh, and also, oh, that's I, was, right. I was very fond of the movie Ernest Goes to Camp. <laughs> so, so they are going to need to steal all this stuff back and do that. They're going to need to. They're going to need to uh, to to do a heist. <gasps> it's heist time. It's time that's now. Right. Chase does not like to talk about this as stealing, but everybody's no. just going to deal with it. Also, Blades wants a code name. Uh, yes. Which Quick Shadow says is irrelevant, and he says that is uh, not very flattering, but he can go with it. Hmm. <laughs> and, and everybody else is just all, you son of a bitch. I'm in. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Oh, and I'll, there's also a bit in that news report where Huxley Prescott refers to his vast viewing public, which amused me. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Huxley Prescott, your viewing public is the people of one island in Maine. <laughs> yeah. He he has his hopes and dreams. There might be the odd person tuning in in, like, I don't know, Bangor or something. Hmm. Like, maybe one year he, like, interviewed Stephen King when he came to uh, to the Crawdad Festival. Ooh. <laughs> big, uh, big public access vibes. Very much so. Right up there with uh, Wayne's World and... Uh, uh, Ten Forward, the Canadian public access show, which was a an all Star Trek call in show. Oh, man, see if I had been sure. just a little bit older, I would have been doing that kind of stuff. I just wasn't quite old enough to sign up for things or sign legal contracts. 
hosted by a guy wearing a a very skillfully made replica of one of those like maroon uniforms they wore in the uh, TOS movies. Oh, Ooh, cool. those were fancy. Yeah. Those are really elaborate. There are clips on YouTube, and they are usually pretty hilarious, because <laughs> you get exactly the kind of people calling you to a Star Trek call-in show that you would expect. Yes. Oh. So every few weeks, there's a call in Klingon. So drunk. Yes. A bunch of drugs. Mm. And then, uh, inexplicably, every couple of weeks... Um... Oh. That's how you can tell I'm tired. I can't think of the name. Jeffrey Combs calls in. Oh. But always is a different guy. It's bizarre. <laughs> yeah. That would be great. Okay, James, I know it's you, Jeffrey Combs. <laughs> that would be a great <laughs> bit. All right. So, the heist is on now. Graham and Boulder, they're setting up uh they're setting up cell interception technology outside of Madeline's vast compound. That is a real thing that cops do. Yeah. Yes. I think what is it? Is it a stingray, stingray. they called? Yes. Stingray. I guess that might be like a trademark, because otherwise you'd think they'd use it, because it's a cool word. Yeah, Stingray. I'm, I'm pretty sure it's an actual, like, trademarked commercial yeah. product available to military and law enforcement agencies. They should have called it, I don't know, the, you know, the scorpion fish or something. <laughs> yes. The Atlantic Torpedo. <laughs> so they're doing up that, and that's gonna intercept all her communications, and meanwhile... Uh, Cade and Chase are uh, setting up some road spikes, some uh, some caltrops. Yes. And uh, I, I, you would think they would use like a spike strip for this, but I feel the caltrops are more James Bond. Yeah, yeah. yeah I agree. They're definitely Bond movies where like his car drops those caltrops. Hmm. Maybe harder to just see as you're driving too. Mm hmm. You don't want something that she's going to notice before she drives over them. Yeah. So, so she's uh, she's calling her uh, uh, her also slightly less evil daughter uh, Priscilla. I and then, uh, went pretty to quickly, it. Her, yes. Pretty quickly, her uh, her tires get blown out. She uh, so she has to call in front of the car, but of course she isn't calling her actual staff, but rather uh, the heist crew, who instead send in. Uh, quick Shadow, completely holographic driver, and Madeline does not notice that uh, this car is clearly from England. Because <laughs> the steering wheel's on the wrong side. Maybe she's been in Europe so much lately that she just it uh. doesn't. No, she just doesn't notice. She doesn't like mm. click that it's not supposed to be like that here. Yeah, and she knows the car can't be English because its, it's electrical system is still working. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, Heatwave Blades and Chief are pulling a, uh, they're pulling a nope, and they are flying over to this compound disguised as a cloud. <laughs> yes, that's an odd reference, but exactly. <laughs> I mean, you know, they're, they're not about to eat, eat a bunch of people, but. Codenames Rain Cloud and Thunder. Hmm. I mean, oh god, that, that is such a good movie. Uh, what other movie are you going to see where it rains blood? I. That must have happened in some sort of horror, some sort of other horror movie. I'm sure that's happened in horror movies, but it's a very good one. Yeah. Oh, it, it, yes. That's that's one of my favorite shots in that whole movie. That, that is a movie fantastic is shot. Filled with great shots. Anyway, yes, watch Nope. Yes. You'll you'll never look at a chimp the same way again. <laughs> oh, too many dangerous little fuckers. Oh my god, they'll tear you limb from limb. Mm. Ew. Take you apart like a rotisserie chicken. <laughs> it's real. So there, so with his, with uh, so Quick Shadow get uh, you know she she gets into the compound and oh, she opens yeah. up her trunk and here's the the eleventh member Servo the well, robot dog yes but but her Hollow Matter avatar was what was it was it a well it's a British guy but yeah just like a dude yeah I guess not pre pre presumably not a chatty one mm. As, Servo uh, you know is... it's funny. Servo is big dog. Yeah, Servo's big dog. Yes. Servo is how they get it up to 11 <laughs> for yes. Cody's 11. Could have got Salvage, but no, I had to bring the dog in. Hmm. If if they let Salvage come, then Blur would want to come, and yeah, he oh, would yeah. wreck everything. Absolutely. Yeah, you can't do that. This is true. 
Yeah, presumably, I don't know if she has like a voice changer in there or anything, because otherwise, Priscilla might notice. Listen, I, I don't, I don't want to be rude, but don't you sound exactly like that woman who was on Doctor Who, <laughs> <laughs> sir? Listen, I, I, I don't want you to intrude, but I saw like the entire run of ER, and I'm pretty sure you were on like ten seasons of it. <laughs> Oh, if only her cell number weren't down, she could Google, what's that movie where, uh, what's that movie where, uh, that guy from Children of Men robs a casino? <laughs> Michael Caine? Anyway. I think he robs casinos in a couple movies in the 70s. Entirely possible. Anyway. <laughs> All right. So, so yeah, so Quick Shadow, uh, pops a servo out of the trunk. He gets into the building, puts a USB into a computer, which then gives them full access to the security system, evading a uh, brief cameo from uh, Priscilla's robot dog, Y Fido. <laughs> We're in. So they now have total control of the security system, which then allows uh, Blades to drop off Heatwave and Chief. So they get in, they rappel down an elevator shaft, and they do find the super secret treasure room, which does contain this alien technology and also what looks like uh, looks like another thing she picked up in Europe was a bunch of stolen Nazi art. So much art. So much art in here. It's really good because there's a reference to specific... I almost wonder if the chairs are a reference to something. Oh. Because they look... Maybe the original like Chippendales or something. Well, yeah, because they got like a mosaic tile pattern on something. But she's got like The Scream, Mona Lisa, a Picasso... Tutankhamun's coffin or sarcophagus, uh, Venus de Milo, a Mondrian, uh, the, like a Maltese falcon. <laughs> There's <laughs> so many little references in there. That's the the stuff the dreams are made on. Whistler's mother. <laughs> and yeah, they, they so break they. In yeah, so they've grabbed this uh, this stolen technology, and then Cody has also found this Energon. So meanwhile, uh, Priscilla, the aforementioned daughter, is attempting to stream something. She's uh, she's going to Netflix, not necessarily <laughs> chill, but she cannot do either because uh, there's all sorts of heist stuff going on. So she pulls out this USB, and so immediately the alarms go off. The jig is up. Oops. But good news, there's a plan B. And that is that uh, Danny has also brought the the force of uh, potentially the U.S. military on this, <laughs> as she is. Yeah, where the uh, hell did they get this jet thing? I have so many questions. Well, so remember, she's like a test pilot, and I guess they let her keep it for the weekend. I guess I, it's it's a really weird. Like, okay, I guess they could have gotten it from Fowler, but on short notice, and it's real big and weird. I mean, I have to assume this was like a kind of looks like like an Avengers Quinjet or something. It's yeah, yeah it's kinda. a lot. It's got a huge ramp in the back that opens up that she can walk down and big it's... cargo like wing thing with short landing radius. It it is very Avengers. Yeah, yeah. I got I got to get this thing back to uh, the set of Agents of Shield by five. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I was thinking. It's, they got to get it back to Agent Coulson. Uh, but so so you know she try and. Kind of tries to BS Priscilla for a while, telling, saying she had an emergency landing, which doesn't really work. But uh, Chase and Kate are now in the compound as well, and now they're going for the Energon. Mm. So, so while this is going on, she uh, Madeline finds the Chief and Heatwave trying to make off with this uh, technology. She then immobilizes them. And uh, tells them that, hey, you know, uh, I also overheard that, uh, you know, the rescue bots are real. So I'm just going to, uh, you know, uh, you know, I'm going to use this energon and also I'm going to, you know, control the world's power supply. And then and then uses the Vern device, uh, presumably which she's been using to, you know, smooth out those wrinkles. And it's also <laughs> going to erase their memories, which is another thing that it does. Yikes. Time for Nemo surgery. But unfortunately for her, uh, they have already switched to the Vern device for a fake device, which I'm going to dub the Ernest device. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Motion held. And uh, she also made the mistake of, uh, of you know, villainously monologuing about how her evil plan is to control the world's power supply, and he got it all on tape. 
Yay! They pretend to go along with it just long enough to record her confessing. Yep. So she tries to make a break for it, sees that Danny, Chase, and Cade are taking the Energon away in this Quinjet. So, you know, for her last resort, she jumps into this car to get away, but unfortunately, that car is Quick Shadow. <laughs> and then I guess they're just going to take her to, like, jail in Griffin Rock. Yeah? Yeah, they do say the that. The world's most get... easily escapable jail. Kinda. I mean, uh, admittedly, she does not ha- appear to have a great deal of te- technological acumen or minions or superpowers herself. She's just very rich. Mm. She had a bunch of stuff that she stole. That's about it. Yeah, I mean, I don't think she's going to be, you know... I don't think her high-powered lawyers are going to get... Going to argue, you know, cruel and unusual treatment, given that she's getting, you know, three square meals a day from Deputy Barney. <laughs> <laughs> and I think uh, at some point they mentioned that she's going in for like five to ten or something. It's a yeah. long time to spend in a little jail like that. And then presumably they're going to have to somehow keep her quiet about... Um, you know, knowing about the rescue bots and such. Well, they're going to yeah. do that by keeping her on the island. Yeah. I mean, I guess she is just going to have to stay in that uh, that lockup for like ten years, after which I'm sure she'll have gone completely insane. Hmm. I'm sure it's fine. She'll be fine. Yeah, because it's, it's just her and occasionally those two crime druids who always <laughs> escape and never bring her with them. I mean, that seems like a potential villainous team-up, but I feel that they'd feel... You know, it's it's like bringing your mom with you on a heist. Yeah. <laughs> Kinda. Th- those, are, those are definitely two dudes who just enjoy farting up the back of their crime van <laughs> without <laughs> any parental supervision. Yes. I mean, well, I think you mean filling it with weed, but yes. Well, yes. Those guys do not have a meal that does not come from Taco Bell. She doesn't. They don't want to be in danger of having, being forced to wear something that isn't a beige hoodie. Yes. Anyway, so we so we're hauling this uh, this stuff back, and this that is a wrap on Madeline Pinch. By the way, she is apparently in jail for the remainder of the series. Oh well, there's not a lot of series left, so yes. I don't think she even comes back in Rescue Bots Academy. Aww. So we're we're hauling this stuff off to the best left forgotten room with all the uh, other terrifying technology of Griven Rock. And uh, oh hey, uh, I guess we had that power outage. They noticed some defrosting freezer. And of course, this this means that the the doc's ice cream is ruined. But it also means that uh, the evil Dr. Morocco virus action figure has escaped. (gasps) Dun, dun, dun. And that will come back to haunt the bots in uh, the series finale. Ooh, Ooh. we're getting a set up for the finale. We we are. And that is it for for this episode, which I really enjoyed. Yeah. I'm a big fan of the heist movie. Yeah, it's a good heist, and it does seem to follow the rules of a heist. And the set up, get, well, they kind of skip over the gathering of team parts since they're all there. General heist vibes. Yeah, the, the other thing is they, they already, like, they all live in the same building. You don't really need to recruit everybody. Yeah. Yeah, not really. You just have a family meeting. And it has the things go wrong, but things work out in the end, and you're stealing from a villain, so you're not really evil, even though you're stealing, so, you know. Yes, it's a, the it's a, it's a complicated morality, but uh, Chase gets it eventually. He will accept this. All right, and uh, do we have a visionaries corner this week? Oh my god! Oh my god! We do! Oh my god! Okay. <laughs> oh. I'm gonna try. I'm gonna like talk like John Moshida here because this episode. <laughs> So, we have reached my favorite episode, The Overthrow of Merklin by Flint Dilly, a uh, oh, well-known 80s cartoon writer guy, Flint Dilly. This episode, oh my god, look it up on YouTube. You don't have to, like, have watched the series so far to jump in with this episode, though it does call back to a couple things. 
Uh, it is so good. Also, TMS animated the hell out of it. <laughs> Ooh. They animated it so hard. They animated it like they looked at their budget and realized that there had been a decimal place moved somewhere and they actually had <laughs> ten times as much as they thought they did. It's <laughs> really good. So we start off with Darkstorm uh, hanging out. He is annoyed that they have to go to Merklin to get their stuff recharged. So he is scheming for some way around that. Uh, they remember a few episodes. Uh, they kidnapped, <laughs> kidnapped, captured a wizard, another wizard named Falcama, uh, who is the guy who was in the giant Zoids thingy. Uh, so ah. he has been just hanging out in the dungeon using his magic to make like the rats and spiders perform little plays for him. <laughs> uh, so <laughs> they retrieve him from the basement. Uh, Falcama, of course, being a rival wizard, hates Merklin and he is more than r willing to help. So the first thing he tells them they need is something called the Omnipic <laughs> Omnipicron. Uh, from the Anthenaeum. Yeah, the Omnipicron. I, it should be like Omnipticron or something. No, oh, it's Omnipicron. But then it sounds more like a I, robot. I feel this might have been, we wrote it one way, but the voice actors could pronounce it this way. It could be, yeah. yeah. So it is in the Anthenaeum, uh, so they need to go get it. Uh, so they go to this huge, old, like, classical-looking building, and first thing they send Mordred in there. Uh, he goes in and he comes out in on fire because there's a dragon in there. Uh, Recon is like, I'm good with reptiles. My totem animal is a reptile. So I'm going to go and try this. Uh, so he goes in and it's actually this like really sad old dragon. Uh, he Aww. sneaks by it. Uh, he takes the book. He gets out with the book, though he does get a little fire in the butt on his way out. Uh, it, it is a very small, it's, it's a small book. It's not like a huge book. It's a small book. And Darkstorm comments on this and Falcama tells him it was a pocket printing. Uh, so this is the paperback version of the Omnipicron. Uh, so now they need something called Wizard's Bane. Uh, Darkstorm is not thrilled that he's having to do more questing to get out of doing more questing, but he's going to go with it. Uh, so they go get some wizard bane. So Leoric, meanwhile, the our heroes are busy dealing with a zoning meeting. <laughs> <laughs> I I actually realized uh so Leoric, according to the comics, is technically the mayor. <laughs> like he used to be the mayor before the age of technology oh. ended, and that's why he's got big mayor energy and having to deal with zoning meetings. Uh, so he wants to build a barracks, but the people are like, people are noisy and we don't want barracks there. Uh, so Witterquick shows up and says, hey, the Darkling Lords are here to cause problems. Uh, so they go out to meet them and they, the Darkling Lords are intentionally walking into this ambush. They're like, oh boy, we sure normally expect to get captured walking through like this. And they catch them and they're like oh i guess we're getting taken away now uh so they go back to the sign factory which will you will remember from uh, a few episodes ago uh which is basically like being in jail and having to make uh, license plates but since they don't have cars they're just making signs but they're like a couple pigs on a uh, treadmill running this uh, running this line while they're making signs uh merklin shows up to let them out again uh, at this point, they have found the wizard's bane, which is just like a leaf. Uh, and the, this they used to freeze Merklin. They get his orb. Uh, and then Falcama says, shows up. Uh, I think Merklin said something about thinking that wizard's bane had been eradicated. And Falcama says it's just marketed under a different name. Uh, <laughs> 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 I love the show. This is so an extremely much. flint dilly script. It's an extremely flint dilly script. Uh, so now they have the book, they've got the orb, uh, and they decide to just banish both of them to Wizard's Jail, which is <laughs> <laughs> which is a place where all these extremely wizard as wizards are just sitting around playing cards. <laughs> it's, just, it's it's amazing. <laughs> 
Uh, so Darkstorm declares that he alone will control the magic. Uh, he teleports himself out, leaves everyone else behind. Uh, and then the spectral knights come in and he freezes them all so that everybody can escape. Because he's not, I'm not wasting my teleportation magic on everybody. You guys suck. <laughs> <laughs> So then we we cut to Darkstorm hanging out in Merklin's tower, getting a back rub from some sort of fairy woman. Uh, now the Darkling <laughs> oh, yeah. lords have decided that they want a cut of all of this. Uh, they they have complaints that they are not getting enough out of what they have managed to accomplish here. Uh, specifically, Virulina, Recon, and Lexor all speak up as having a, a, a feeling cheated, and a, you get the classic. I will give you all what you deserve. <laughs> oh. So first he turns Virul Virulina old uh, and then turns her to stone. Uh, since Recon, he, he says he makes her as ugly as her soul. Uh, Recon is a mercenary and he only wants money. So he makes him make cash register sounds when he moves, uh, <laughs> which, which uh, Dark Storm says, oh, that, I haven't heard that sound since... The age of technology. Uh, and then he turns him to stone, which, I mean, now he can't make cash register noises, but that's okay. Uh, Lexor, who is a big liar, uh, gets a double who only tells the truth and interprets everything <laughs> Lexor says into something a lot more honest, which it's great. Uh, and then he turns him to stone as well. So, so ironic punishments, and then yeah, you're just stone. Yeah, yeah, he he does ironic punishments, and then he's like, and eh, now I'll turn you to stone because I don't have the patience to deal with that all day. Uh, so he declares that the three remaining ones, Sindar, Mortdred, and Cravix, uh, they are going to benefit because they were loyal. So he's going to he says they'll all get to have slaves, and he's going to make Sindar really smart. So there's this little fantasy bubble of Sindar being very wise and intelligent and then <laughs> saying, oh, but is slavery really a good idea? People with, with no mo proper motivation aren't going to be as productive. And Darkstorm says, well, maybe a little less smart. <laughs> <laughs> Mortred gets his own syncophants because he is such a syncophant. Uh, and so he gets a little fantasy scene of being followed around by people fawning over him. Uh, and Kravix, who is a hair trigger, he's the one who started the big brawl a few episodes ago. He will have a world where nothing makes him angry. And so he's watching a horse race and he's saying, oh, my, my horse is going to win. But honestly, that's getting a little boring. And so his horse loses. And he's like, no, that's more interesting. <laughs> so he, he will have a nice, peaceful world where things go the way he wants them to. So at this point, uh, Darkstorm declares that there is a special secret spell in the back of this book that no one has successfully done. But he is so great and powerful. He is going to do this spell. So he does this spell and it immediately like makes his tower collapse and they all run outside and the ground is shaking. And then this giant demon comes up from the horizon and it looks like thinking like the old original D&D &D Dungeons Ma Dungeon Master's Guide kind of like demon on the horizon. And the demon declares uh, that congratulations, you have triggered the end of the world. <laughs> Whoops. So the pages of the book... Uh, say that the first stage is the plague of the ground, which is the earthquakes they still ha they just had. Uh, the next one is Apocalypse Rises, which was the great demon coming from the horizon. Uh, next is the plague of fire, uh, the rise of vermin, the inundation, and the time of darkness. Uh, oh. And at one point in this mortgage, is like, oh no, who again is Dr. Smith from uh, Lost in Space. It's like, oh no, don't turn the page. Oh no. <laughs> it's, it's really good. Oh no, oh, the pain. time of darkness. So they're like, mm, we should probably go get Marklin back from the wizard's jail, <laughs> which is just like a castle off in the distance. Uh, the ones he turned to stone were apparently not extensively turned to stone. So they show up and are like, okay, asshole. And they show up just in time for the plague of fire. 
which they again animate the hell out of. Uh, the plague of fire is just flaming meteors falling from the sky. Uh, they have uh, Sindar summon the staff of protection to put a force dome over them so they get through it. Uh, next is the pla- the rise of vermin, which are giant lizard rats that burrow oh. up from the ground, uh, oh. and they use the staff of destruction to help with that one. Uh, and then, oh, actually, yes, <laughs> I was going to say actually, it's uh, Krav- Kravix has the staff of protection. Sindar has the staff of destruction. These mm. things are very similar and hard to keep straight. <laughs> <laughs> so they run towards the wizard's jail, which is just a big castle up on a hill off in the distance. Uh, and they know that they need to run because the next one is the inundation. Uh, and sure oh. enough, a great tidal wave comes over the horizon and they run from it. Uh, they just barely get to the make it near the castle, uh, but they're still flooded and uh, Viralina has to help them even though she doesn't want to because she doesn't want to help anybody. <laughs> so they get inside and again, the wizards are playing at cards and because they are wizards, they are cheating at cards. <laughs> <laughs> it is so good. Uh, Dark Storm begs for help uh, and Merklin says, well, yeah, basically this is our safeguard is that any mortal who is full of himself enough to steal this stuff is going to try to use whatever spell we say is the scariest. So we make this spell that's going to make you come running back to us to fix it. Uh, And so he does. uh, And he basically says, you guys are on your own now, assholes. (laughs) And there's this great bit. So he's like, you're not, I'm not helping you guys anymore. If you get thrown in prison again, I'm not coming and helping you out. I will fix this, and then I don't want to see you anymore. And he's like, and don't you release these other wizards from this jail. Oh, drat, they're gone. And <laughs> the doors open, and all the extremely wizard-ass wizards have left. Uh, everything literally reverses all the way back to the start of the zoning meeting. Uh, so there's just the whole episode just rewinds. Uh, and then you get uh, Leoric and Ektar laughing about how everything is so boring now, and they, they kind of miss having an exciting adventure. Uh, and then we end with one of those extremely wizardy wizards on a wagon looking mischievous. So, uh, yeah, it is. It's a really fun episode. It's a really Flint Dilly episode. It's just, it's very funny. And also, like I said, they just animate the they animate it to death. It's beautiful. Uh, so yes, that is the overthrow of Merklin. <laughs> uh, Felix, what do you? Hi, cat. Oh, it's cat time. All right. Well, that is it for uh, for us for this week. We'll be back next week with more <gasps> uh, Transformers Rescue Bots. And uh, until then, you can find us all over the internet. We're on Twitter. We're on Mastodon. <laughs> we're on Facebook, and we have a Patreon. Yes, we are hosted on iaconunderground.net, uh, where also David and I have restarted doing our weekly news podcasts under the Yay. Icon Underground radio stream. Uh, we always say they're going to be short, and then they never are. Uh, yeah, well, the last one was normal episode length, 45 minutes. Going should be to shorter s- than that. They're definitely going to start becoming shorter once we start having to record them at, like, 1 in the morning because of my work oh. schedule. But, you know, it's fun. It's fun to do those. Uh so, patreon.com slash Iacon Underground is where you can find our Patreon specials uh, for as little as a dollar a month. Uh, I think we're probably going to be a little late with May's, so that means for June you're going to get a double shot of the Masters of the Universe movie, and then whatever we decide to do for the actual June one. That's right. Something shorter, probably. <laughs> yes. That's probably something not feature length. Something with less Tom Paris in it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I forgot freaking Tom Paris. Is, I knew Courtney Cox was in it. It's like, Tom Paris, the hell? Less Dolph Lundgren. I can't promise less Dolph Lundgren. There there may be similar amounts of Dolph Lundgren. It depends. What other things have Dolph Lundgren? A Punisher movie? Um... Uh, the, 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 the Johnny Mnemonic did. 
Oh, that's true. Oh, that, yeah, that's right. This yeah. is a, this is a return appearance for Mr. Dolph Lundgren on the <laughs> on this program. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I believe this is our first incursion into Frank Langella territory, though. Ooh. Yes. Nice. Nice. So yeah. And also, and we're starting with Peak. Yes. But yeah. Possibly his finest role. <laughs> yes. It's pretty good. I would, it's either that or, of course, uh, Frost Skeletor, the. Uh, <laughs> In which, uh, in which a repentant uh, post Masters of the Universe Skeletor uh, talks with interviewer David Frost about uh, his, his many crimes, but but you understand, David, when the Skeletor does it, it is not illegal. That would be amazing. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but uh, and of course, we'll be back next week with more Rescue Bots as we hit our well, not our hundredth episode, but Rescue Bots hits its hundredth episode. Well, it's going to be three ninety. We're getting close wow. to 400. Oh. So, yeah. So, so join us next time when we go Which, to... Oh, wait. That actually means that... Oh, my God. Like, Are we getting what? close to 400? A Which quarter is... of our episodes are rescue bots. Wow. That's a lot. Yes. It's a long show. Yeah. So, yeah. Join us next time when we're going to infinity and back. <laughs> Until then, I'm Rob. I'm Jen. There and back again. My robot friends. Uh, okay, can I get to the... Okay. There, and I, I resisted the urge to go off on a diversion about how I actually found the Visionary's toy in the wild this week. <laughs>
Cool. Not your problem. All right. <laughs>